In the past couple of years, 2012 to 2014, uh, you have seen this firsthand. Uh, undocumented immigrants in your state up by about uh, more than 10 percent. It's a big number. What would these new immigration policies, uh, increased detention facilities, increased agents mean for your state? Well, it's hard to say. I, right now, there's still so much uncertainty about what he's really talking about. Uh, but certainly, we look at, from several points of view, I mean, what's the cost going to be? To I mean, uh, one rumor has, you know, the, the federal government hiring 10,000 ICE agents, 10,000 new ICE agents, I mean, put in the new facilities they need, incredible expense. A and then secondly, we're under 3 percent unemployment here right now. And in agriculture, in construction, even in tech, you know, we're not sure how many undocumented people are working in these agencies, but w this might be the perfect time to kind of look at Congress to try and address and find what is the right compromise and let's let's okay. really solve this problem that's been haunting us for 20 years. So in your state, we've been covering this story, Governor, of uh, Jeanette Vizguera. She's an undocumented immigrant, mother of four. She's currently taking refuge at a church in Colorado um, because she says she's afraid of being deported and separated from her children because of the executive order. Here she is. I belong here. This is my home. So as the governor of the state in charge of law enforcement, I'm, what should happen here? Should they go into the church to, to get her because she is defying the rules? Should they not? What, what do you say? Well, it is hard to imagine going into a church in a sanctuary like that and, and dragging somebody out. Yeah. Uh, you know, an awful lot of successful law enforcement is based on the, the trust that is built up over many years between the local police force or the state patrol and the community. And, uh, and that's another serious cost that this kind of, this notion of going around, you know, rounding people up and hauling them off into, you know, detention facilities and then without much due process, to, you know, uh, expelling them from the country. There are serious costs to our economy and to the fabric of our community. You know, uh, back, it's a tough issue, right? Back a few years ago, uh, we did a report about a Canadian woman. She was married to an American citizen, um, and they had a baby. Uh, she wasn't allowed to return to the United States as she went through the whole process, right, Till she had a green card in her hand. As that time went by, she wasn't with her husband. He missed all the firsts uh, for, his, uh, for his baby because he was in the National Guard, full-time student. Um, it's, a, it's a tragic story, right? I mean, this family was separated as the mother waited uh, until she could come in legally. The big question, of course, is if they played by the rules, shouldn't others as, as well? We see these heart-wrenching stories like the one in that church in your state, but, but, but this is a real question. No, it is. And I, I mean, look at countries come with borders, right? And, and borders create complexity, and there are an awful lot of tough decisions. I'm the first person to say that we should be really overhauling a lot of these rules and, and figuring out what is the right number of people that we need to make sure that our workforce is what our, our, our business community, community needs and, and yet make sure we're not you know, losing jobs that, that Americans could fill. And, but you know, in Colorado, I can tell you, there are a lot of farming jobs and ranching jobs that people offer 20 bucks an hour and they can't fill them. There are people trying to build homes and they're yeah. trying to hire people to hang sheetrock or do plumbing. They can't fill those jobs. At, 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 at 18, 20, some of them they're offering, you know, by your third year, you're making $60,000 a year. They can't they find can't people them. to work. So the Hill listed you as one of the top Democratic contenders to run for president, uh, Governor, and you were reportedly one of four <laughs> Democrats that Steve Bannon, I don't know if you know this, but reportedly Steve Bannon <laughs> asked uh, Reese for research on you. Um, if it's bad, they're going to find it. Uh, do you think you could beat Donald Trump if you ran? Um, but, but just to help Mr. Bannon, you know, last year I did uh, put out uh, a so-called memoir. I, I like to think I'm too young to really write a memoir, but my life in beer and politics is called The Opposite of Woe. It's got every bad thing, and there's a lot of them that I've ever, ever done. So I don't think they have to worry too much about me coming, you know, coming at them from their, from their blind side. <laughs> but but, but, you're, but it's, it's on the table. Oh, I don't know. It's going to be a lot of things on the table. You know, I think the key in the next couple of years is to figure out how do we get this with all the turmoil going on, how do we make sure we keep our focus and move the country forward and figure out, you know, where are the, those lines that should not be crossed? Uh, and I think both between states and federal government, you're going to see a whole, a whole lot more Democratic governors 
saying that, that we believe in states' rights uh, and that the federal government shouldn't come and impose uh, these burdens on us. Uh, and I think you're going to see more Republican governors saying, hey, don't okay. come and tell us you're going to cut back our Medicaid expansion, right? All right. Well, Governor, thank you very much. It's, I appreciate your time. Strange times.